Okay. Well, okay. Better, Everybody can hear me. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Sounds like somebody's having a conversation. Hello, everybody. Welcome back after two weeks, after rather a roller coaster, eventful two weeks. I think we yeah. all agree with that. Um, I have several. Hello. Oh, stop, stop. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, somebody's in the back. It's a little distracting. Uh, okay, so let's proceed and assume they stop there. <laughs> Anyway, thank you all for, you know, uh, being understanding about taking that oh, one week hiatus, but I, I think it's important. I'm not going to get, you know, partisan or anything like that. But uh, the point is, uh, we didn't know, as everyone predicted on election night or even the next night, uh, which I didn't have either Wednesday or uh, the uh, Tuesday classes, I gave everyone the week off to use however you saw fit, whether it was to vote at the last minute or to help with poll watching as my mother used to do. And believe it or not, when we were in Chicago and she was a poll watcher, yes, this is how far back that goes. When Kennedy was elected president, uh, there was accusations of dead people voting. I'm sorry, BS. My mother had been a, a precinct captain in several different precincts and was good friends with those and all the other surrounding ones. And the whole southern side of Chicago, which is like a third of the population of the city where the alleged dead people voting occurred. And that was just a myth. It happens a lot. We're hearing it again. <laughs> in any case, uh, we survived as a country somewhat without any violence. That, that isn't true of a lot of other countries that have contested elections. Uh, so I think we should feel at least somewhat reassured that the system of democracy is better than alternatives. Well, maybe not everyone agrees, but uh, if you've ever been to places like Russia, <laughs> where they have one party and only one real candidate uh, every time there's a so-called election, I think you can see the difference. Anyway, now time to focus on the remaining portion of this semester. So I'm going to go ahead and put myself on speaker view so I can... Uh, and of course, any moment that you have questions, feel free to, you know, chime in. Um, so a couple of announcements to start with. Um, this is not, again, to be partisan, but there was a piece I sent you guys an email, and I know how busy everyone was, and I know most of you never even looked or do tend to look at print editions of newspapers, but this is still online on the online edition. The Sunday that is last Sunday before the election, so I guess that would mean a week ago Sunday, the edition, November 1st, of your local paper. I've always respected it. I read it whenever I'm up there, and it's in the cafeteria for free, as you know, both both campuses. Um, they ran this piece I did here, this one, uh, about, they even put a rather terribly bad picture. I hate, I don't even show it to you. But Dr. Chong read it, our you know college president, right? And he was saying things about it that I thought were relevant, such as let's hope that that scenario I described, which was from the 1876 election. I know that sounds like, how could that be relevant? Oh yeah, uh, you'll see what I mean if you haven't. And there's no requirement for anybody to read any of these things, but you might find it interesting because there was a uh, sort of similar situation. There we go from uh, what we're seeing now with uh, one, I will just say one party contesting whether or not the one that had won the other party, of course, both the popular and electoral college that year should or shouldn't be declared the winner of the presidency. And it, it didn't get resolved till two days before the inauguration. And it was uh, not, not a, a solution that I think today would be accepted by most people because the person that had lost, the candidate who had lost both the electoral college and the popular vote both managed to, well, the opposition party, I won't say which one it was, said, steal that election. So anyway, these things, you know, history has a way of repeating itself. And of course, we're seeing the influences of art. And we will tonight see some other topics as we do every night. I, I'm sure you would agree that are relevant to today, even if the works of art are well, thousands in the early half of this semester are now hundreds of years old. They still address some of the topics that are relevant to today. Uh, you know, issues, concerns, conflicts, 
uh, trends that we see today. So we'll get to the uh, slides in just a few minutes. Now, first. Uh, one, one question. Which yes, issue please. is that one for the newspaper for the article is from um, Sunday or? Sunday, November 1st, yeah. Now, if you happen to be able to send me, um, uh, well, it's a headache for most of you. You don't probably even use stamps, right? <laughs> Uh, an actual hard copy because I can see it online. So that 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 would have to admit someone else here, Madison. Hang on, let me just take a second. Yeah, I would give you extra credit if you can do what. Well, this was my reader, so I didn't give her extra credit. One of my readers, the one I've known the longest, who is very involved in you know uh, getting people registered to vote and, and all that stuff, and out to the polls or in their ballots into the you know drop off boxes or the uh, polling places on time. Uh, in any case, uh, I would offer extra credit if any of you are able to uh, either, I don't know, I guess you could print out a version. Maybe you can. I don't know. I don't do that for their online edition. It's on the op-ed section, and that will be labeled forum, but it'll say commentary and opinion. You know, op-ed is abbreviation for opinion editorial page. It's on the front page above the fold. They don't always give a guest editorial that slot. So it's the uh, B9, page B9. Anyway, you can't miss it because it'll be the only piece on that day, Sunday the 1st, a week before this Sunday, before the election. The whole point was this, it was just a heads up about what might happen so that people might who might think, well, so what if my vote either doesn't get counted or I take you know my time and I miss the deadline to get it in, it won't matter. Well, it does, whatever your perspective or your political point of view is. So I was writing about that. And, and if any of you can send me a, a, either a printout or a hard copy, the hard copies I know aren't likely. If you know someone who subscribes, some older relative or something, um, then, then I would give you um, a five points extra credit or, yeah, I think that's fair. That's the same as an article. The articles are one of the options you always have. Uh, any article about art, this one is a little different. It's about history, but it's relevant. It's current, it's local. The, uh, so that would be uh, the Press, Santa Rosa Press Democrat, November 1st in the front page of the opinion editorial page. Okay, moving on. Midterms. Okay, um, I haven't had uh, too many, but a few students have not yet asked for their grades yet. If you didn't know this, you should email me so I can immediately respond. What you will get is uh, two things. The actual, uh, well, three if you count, the raw score, the letter grade, which should be obvious, but I will state that. And then a brief explanation if you didn't get an A. Now, if you got an A, there's nothing to say. You know, you did well. I will say something. I usually congratulate you for that, of course. And a lot of people got A's. But if you got anything less than an A, I'll explain what you missed, okay, in one or two or three lines. Uh, and you can do that anytime, but uh, I think you'd want to know that before the next paper, which I'm going to get to in a couple minutes. A due date so that you know how many points you have combining your first paper uh, grade in you know total points and the points you got on the midterm plus any extra credit. Not that many people have done extra credit and I'm going to go into that in a minute but first again if you didn't get your grade you need to if you want it in a timely fashion it doesn't matter when I'll get it to you within usually 24 hours of when you send me an email to mark w at aol not the um, campus one because there is so much I call it administrative spam and I'm not the only one there's just dozens of things every day that aren't relevant to anything that I teach or any of my students that we have to wade through I have a high spam filter on my AOL believe it or not so I don't get anywhere near as much of that it's much easier for me to download and open and read and, and grade whatever any of your papers or exams or for my readers to do that on the AOL okay so everybody knows my my email address by now on AOL, Mark, M-A-R-K-W at AOL.com. However, a few people didn't even contact me about the exam and they didn't drop the course. I got a couple of emails today, people saying, oh, uh, can I know my grade? And if they didn't take the midterm, well, it's not gonna be very good. So I am probably, I just, my reader and I had this conversation on Sunday when we met to go over this semester and how things are going and, and that form she created for us to grade the papers and stuff, which I hadn't thought of. So, you know, I had to pay her, of course, for her work. And she said, you're too lenient. Well, that's not how I look at it. I'd rather have people not give up midway through the semester or any, <coughs> excuse me, at any point where they think they're too far behind. And so I capped the points off for late papers at 10. 
And you can make that up with extra credit. And again, we'll get to the very brief summary recap because I already sent you an email about that last week in detail, but I'll briefly recap what those options are in a minute. But for those who didn't show up for the exam or take it, I posted it and left it even longer than I said through the end of the day. I think it was Sunday morning that I finally deleted it. Uh, you have one option to try and make it up. And it's not my rule. This is the district's rule and our art department rule. In order to be allowed to do any kind of makeup assignment to make up for missing points from a missed exam, we need, I, the instructor, will need to see something in you know visual evidence and obviously in this case would be digitally provided a screenshot probably of something in writing that verifies you had either a medical or family emergency during that week anytime during the week of the exam i broadened that it's not just the day that it was scheduled because it was on there for four or five days so anytime during that week uh when i posted it the first ver uh, class was you know tuesday night the 13th of uh, October through the 17th. And I'll send you an email as a reminder, but that only applies to a handful of people. And if you have such evidence and you send it to me, then I will discuss with you, not now over the you know, Zoom class uh, format, but uh, individually by email, what your options are. But if you don't, I can't, there's nothing I can do about it. That, that's not my rule, uh, but you can make up 50 points, that's half of the total possible points on a um, uh, missed exam uh, with extra credit. And then hopefully do well on your two papers in the final, and you still would have a shot at getting a grade that I'm going to prove to you mathematically. Now, I usually do this on a whiteboard. I've already explained that's so cumbersome. I only used it for that first uh, time we did the nine elements because we needed to have it for that purpose. So I'm going to write down here and I'm going to hold it up for all of you to see. Let's say that your first paper you got, uh, most people got a good grade. Say, say you got 90. And then on uh, the midterm, you didn't do as well. Some people didn't. Most people did A's and B's, but not everybody always does that. And you can have, everyone has bad exam days in every uh, college semester that I ever had, and I'm sure many of you are used to it. So let's say that you got uh, 60 on that. Okay, that would mean your combined total, right, is 150. So that would mean half of that, your grade so far, is a C. Okay, but what if you didn't get 60? So I'm going to cross it. I'll show you this in a minute. I'm just telling you now. Um, maybe 40. That has happened to a few people. Then what's your total? It's 130 divided by two, of course, right? And that gets you down to a D and you might think, forget it. I can't, how can I recover from that this late in the semester? I'm gonna prove that you can still get a good grade, even if that's what happened to you. Let's go with, you know, you can adjust these numbers in your own, you know, calculations on your own later, not now during class, if you want to. Um, but you'll see my point. This is a standard uh, practice I, I do or exercise, I should say. So you can plug in your own numbers. Okay, so let's say you, you just bombed the midterm, uh, but you did well, but not perfectly on the first paper. So then what happens? Okay, add your 50 points extra credit, right? And then you get on your second paper, there's no reason you shouldn't get an A. If you didn't on the first one, uh, at least let's say 95, you might miss one or two things. Where are you then at the point where you're about to take the final? Well, then we'll add these together. Maybe it's uh, you're at 275 points is your subtotal. I'll write it on here. And then when I hold up to the screen, if you want to take a screenshot, you can or just look at it. So what do you need to get a B in the class? 320. So in other words, what do you need to get on the final to get at least a B if you got an F on the midterm? Uh, and, uh, you know, an A minus or whatever, you can adjust that, maybe a B uh, on your, on your um, first paper and an A on your second. No reason not to be able to get an A on the second. If you apply yourself, you should know what happened with the first one if you didn't get an A and what to do to improve it. So here we are. That means you have only 45 points on the final. That's, and you're not gonna aim that low, nobody does, right? But that gives you a shot at a B. And could you even get 
an A. Well, you'd have to really pull an ace out of the hole, a rabbit out of the hat, but you, you could. And I'll prove that to you too, because that's 360. So all you'd have to get is 85, right? Uh, which is doable on the final, since it's an open book test and you have it to take home and you have three or four days to, to work on it. I'll leave it posted until Saturday again, the Saturday after the final exam week. But I have to take it down then because I have to get the grades in by the following week. Okay, so, so that will give you a, an A. So you can get an A or a B if you apply yourself and use the extra credit options and max them out. Nobody's done that yet. Some of you, uh, I'm sure, feel you don't need to. But if you're one of those people who did, you see what I'm doing. Now, let's say that you got only 80 on your first paper. Well, then you would have to adjust that where the final needs to be if you did an A on your second paper, the final would need to be um, 10 points more, meaning 55, which is just a barely passing grade, it's certainly achievable, and that would give you a B, uh, and so forth. I think you get the, the concept, I hope you do. If anybody has questions, you know at any point, I've said this several times, and I'll keep saying it again before up until finals, you can email me about how you're doing, and then I can tell you how many more points you need to get whatever grade you, well, I assume you all want an A, most people do, Anyway, I hope that helps to reassure you that there are ways to recover from a, a bad uh, exam, uh, you know, or, or even a, a mediocre paper and a bad exam. The key is you're being proactive and taking all the extra credit options. So let's talk about that now. Um, <clears throat> extra credit briefly, there are five, I think I have that right, five options now. And then, of course, they all have to be submitted digitally. Uh, well, you could mail me some, but who's going to do that, right? An article, a hard copy. Well, that might happen with if it's by any chance any copies floating around of the op-ed piece I did in the Press Democrat. But in general, you're going to do all of these online. Okay, first, articles. Every article is worth five points. I'm going to cap that at four. That's reasonable because that's 20 points extra credit. And those are, that, that's like a a gimme. That's what I used to call it. You know, it, it's the easiest option. It doesn't take much uh, brain power. It's just looking up an article of at least one full page, and I have to have an illustration on any topic relating to art, and that you can then send. Yeah, I'm going to admit this person there. So then, if you send me a copy of an article about any topic relating to art, it doesn't have to be from the uh, syllabus, so the periods we're covering, it can be any modern artist or ancient or work of art, an archeological find in Egypt. There's so much every day, there's new things online. Um, as a you know PDF file that I can open and see what it's about, you get five points. So you can do that four times, okay? That's worth 20 points right there. Uh, another option is uh, to watch a movie. Uh, one, uh, uh, well, a minimum of one hour, is how I put it. Feature length movie or documentary. It can be either, you know, a, a, a Hollywood, what, have to be Hollywood, <laughs> uh, you know, a film, a dramatic interpretation, like the movies about the life of Frida Kahlo, just called Frida, and that's excellent. Uh, and so many have been done about Van Gogh. My favorite is Lust for Life, and there's one about Toulouse Lautrec uh, called Moulin Rouge. Don't confuse that one with the really poorly done one with the same title that had uh, Nicole Kidman in it, that, that wasn't very good. Uh, that doesn't have any accuracy to it. So the one with uh, Jose Ferrer that won a bunch of Academy Awards, yes, in the 1950s, it was that far back. Uh, that movie, if you see it, I think you will be blown away by, he walked, he had his legs at the knee tied behind his, him so that he had to walk on pads on knee pads through the entire filming for month after month. He actually ended up to go to the hospital and developed arthritis in his knee joints. He won the Academy Award for that, portraying Tulsa Trek, because Jose Ferrer is like six foot four or something, or six two, and he was portraying a man four foot ten. Uh, he literally, that movie will either bring tears to your, your eyes or you're not paying attention. It's such a powerful movie about what he went through to achieve the art he did and how tragic his um, final years were. Anyway, beautiful movie. I'm not you know, pushing just any one film. So that kind of thing, or a documentary of one hour or more about any artist or any topic. Uh, no, sorry, I meant artist, life of an artist that has to do with the life of an artist. That's for this third option. And then write two pages. It, it doesn't have to have, you know, great syntax and style. And I'm not counting points off for grammar 
or anything. It's just your opinions, not opinions, your, your observations about what you learned from that movie about that artist, their life and their work. So maybe a page roughly on each, you know, what about what they, the art they created, what style was it or what moved you or motivated you about what you maybe didn't like it. So you could say that too, why you didn't like their art. <clears throat> Though hopefully you'll watch movies or documents about artists you like, whose work you like, but that's up to you. And then something about their life and, and just two pages, you know, as long as it's more than one and a half pages, you get 10 points. Okay, uh, so you can do that, uh, well, let's say twice. And then you can go to a museum. There aren't many open, but I'm gonna go, unless not going with they close it to the Frida Kahlo exhibit with a friend. If they don't close the museum, the De Young, it's still there. And I've talked to two other people who've been there. And they said it was so, I mean, I called up and made a reservation. You have to RSVP on their website or uh, their phone number, they give it to you on their website. At the uh, De Young Museum in San Francisco, Golden Gate Park, that's worth 10 points when you show me proof that you went to the museum, which would be, of course, a receipt uh, or, or some kind of uh, record of your having paid for the admission to the museum. Uh, or even photos of you there, that would be all right. If they, uh, they'll let you do that. You have to wear a mask and every room is uh, limited to a certain number of people, 25% capacity. So it's about as safe as you can be to be indoors. And they sterilize everything every 10 minutes from what I heard, or maybe it's every 15 or 20 in every room. So uh, the cafeteria is not open. Unfortunately, it's a great cafeteria, but whatever, you know, got to keep things safe. So it's just the museum and the exhibits, not only Frida Kahlo's, artwork is that's the special a new exhibit that's only there till well February actually but any of the permanent collection uh it just any part of the museum you go to I, I don't see need to see proof you saw the whole museum uh you know it's up to you what, what, what uh, format you want to verify it's easiest if it's a, a photocopy or a screenshot rather of a receipt right uh, or a reservation but I need to know you actually went in the museum and that you should be able to do easily by maybe writing two or three lines about what you saw or else a photo of you there that your friend, I assume most people want to go to the museum with someone. It's not as much fun alone, but it's up to you. So any proof that you were inside the museum, you get 10 points. <clears throat> and then the last option is the, uh, well, actually in a way it's the easiest and it's worth the most points and it's the quickest. And that's download either of those two art related novels that I wrote, which I already put in an email, so I won't, you know, recap all the facts about them. I'll just say they're on Amazon Kindle. If you have Kindle Unlimited, they're free. Otherwise, they're like three ninety nine or something. I didn't set that. They are, and that's like not much, right? The price of a cup of coffee. And those, you don't have to prove that you read them to get fifteen points. If you show me a, a screenshot proving that you downloaded them or ordered them, and that would mean a screenshot of the last chapter. Why? Because the first three chapters are posted free of every novel and every book on Amazon Kindle. You know this if you bought books that way. <clears throat> so I need to know that you actually download them. And then if you choose to write a review, good, bad, or in between, I, the reviews are all over the place. You can take a look, They're mostly good ones, but those are reviews that, uh, you know, people said things sometimes, you know, critical. That's not the point. The point is it would indicate you read part even part of it. That's another 10 points. So there's 25 points for either one of those two novels. Uh, one is South Side Story, briefly mentioning what is it about growing up in Chicago in the early 60s uh, and actually witnessing people like Malcolm X speak. You know, my mother actually wanted us to go see him. He was at the mosque, the Black Muslim mosque there at the time I was growing up, as well as the civil rights movement, uh, immigration issues, uh, the Cold War, nuclear, nearly being destroyed by uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. People thought they were going to die. <laughs> it's hard to explain that unless you know someone who lived through it. So that's that. That's South Side Story. And the other one is, is it's ostensibly a murder mystery, but really it's much more than that. It's about the history and the architecture of the Bay Area. And the secondary theme is the Russian mafia, which was just coming into America about the early 90s. That's what it's said in the early 90s in the Bay Area. And there's about uh, two dozen architectural sites that I spend a lot of time accurately describing in that. So that's called the open house murders. Okay. Now, any questions about extra credit or uh, makeup or, uh, rules for makeups for exams or anything about grades? Any questions? All right. So last thing on this, and then we'll get started with tonight's lecture. Uh, 
And that is the second short paper is due next week. Oh, okay, another person wants to be admitted. Okay, once again, the second paper is due next week. Uh, I'm gonna give you an extended period where it won't be late if I get it by uh, midnight on Friday of that week. So that would mean um, Friday the 20th. Why we need it before me and the readers? Because hey, the next week is Thanksgiving week. We still have, we have classes that because you know we're at home and I don't know how many of you're going to have friends over on Thanksgiving. I'm not sure what we're going. Me and my family usually invite friends over, but we have to think that one through. So Thursday, of course, if I had a class, I'd have canceled it. But uh, we are having class next week, and you do want to catch the lecture or at least the replay of it or the recorded version on uh, uh, YouTube if you don't catch it live. Uh, but the point is that that gets us down to just two weeks between Thanksgiving and when I wanted the papers returned to you. So my goal is always to try and get them back in two weeks, but you got to give us an extra week, me and the readers. I mean, whatever your plans are, I can't imagine. Of course, that's uh, your business, but I can tell you that, it, that it, several already of the three readers, two of them that I hired have told me they uh, will not be available to grade papers that week. It is a holiday week. Even if they're taking online Zoom classes at the JC, as, as all three of them are actually, <clears throat> and, and we are having ours. Uh, so, so give me, that means if you submit them the week before Thanksgiving, you'll get them back on time, <coughs> which would be, I have to do the math in my head, uh, the uh, first week of, sorry, second week of December, the second week of December, you'll have all your papers back. Uh, so I'll put an email out about that. Okay, so don't forget, that means you should have picked a topic. And if you have it, you have time, you know how to do it. I will, uh, if anyone needs me to, I can resend the, um, you know, the, the, the five requirements handout. You should still have that from the first paper uh, or the uh, cover sheet. I'll probably just do that anyway, so that you all have it and use that. Remember, you have to submit it with the cover sheet as a PDF file to my Mark W at AOL. So hopefully no later than Friday of next week um, before midnight, uh, you'll be able to submit your paper. So there'll be no points uh, off for being late. Your second paper, then you'll be done with three quarters of the assignments in this class. Okay, any questions about the second paper? Remember the topics, I think by now everyone should know any art from any period, any style, any artist that you choose except your own. No limitations. You choose something you really care about that interests you enough, motivates you enough to want to research it. Okay, one more time. Any questions about papers, second papers, uh, makeup, work, okay, uh, or extra credit. <clears throat> All right, so tonight we're going to do something I think most of you will be glad to, to hear. We're going to end early and earlier than we have, I think, ever before. Why? Because out of the six slides tonight, there's one that is a snooze. It's just not interesting in this. There isn't much to say about it. So when we get to it, I'll cut it. What does that boil down to? Five. We have, there we go, five must know slides, of which at least one will be one of those, I'll tell you when we get to it, that I won't cut from the study list and you wanna make extra thorough notes because it has a high possibility as in each lecture each week, there's at least one and usually it's two or three, but tonight there'll be at least one. So what we can do is, unless people object, if I don't hear any objection, I'll assume it's uh, unanimous. Now we can just go through those five slides, one you know, right after the other, all in one sitting and then just, go past where the normal break is, about 8.40, 8.45, and end for the night. Maybe even earlier, depending on um, the various things like questions or people joining late. And then I'll stick around. I always do as long as there are any questions afterwards. So we should aim for ending between, I would say 8.35 and 8.45, maybe 8.50, which is the earliest we've ever ended. Um, okay, so nobody objects to that? No, sounds good. Yeah, good, glad to hear yeah. Okay, so before we get to the first slide, a little context, and I'm going to take a little coffee. I hope no one's offended by it. <laughs> it's not Hawaiian coffee, best coffee in the world, at least that I, well, Cuban coffee is pretty good too. <laughs> but you got to go to those islands to get the real stuff. At least that's what I found, because the stuff they send, they ship out is more for tourists. <clears throat> anyway, uh, okay, so what do we say about the medieval art? Well, first of all, that term, I even had this discussion just tonight with my wife when we were searching up at one slide that wasn't in the file, that didn't get 
digitalized by the, I'm not criticizing, she did a great job. You've heard me say this, the slide library was long gone now. She retired over a year ago, but she did a really good job of transferring all my regular slide slides from Kodak carousel trays, you know, with plastic mounts. Some of you don't talk about ancient stuff that your aunt and uncle might or grandparents might still have in their house. Uh, that was a lot of work, hundreds of them, but some one or two here and there didn't get transferred. And one of them was the last slide we're gonna see tonight. St. Basil's Cathedral, magnificent. It's in the heart of Moscow, and uh, I'll explain why that one is one I won't cut from the study list. Anyway, the point is before we get to the first must slide, what does medieval mean? Well, most people associate the phrase or, or, or uh, consider the two phrases synonymous, the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages. That's not correct, that, that's misleading. The Dark Ages usually implies the earlier period of the Middle Ages from the fall of Rome, and we rounded up to 500. Rome fell in 476 AD, but in any case, just say about 500, by which time there was no unified system of government anywhere in Europe. There were local, you know, warlords, that's all there was, um, and chaos and, you know, ignorance and superstition. And violence. Um, it wasn't a good time <laughs> to be living on the continent of Europe anyway. Um, I, unless you were in the part, the small section of it that the Byzantines were later going to conquer, but they didn't do that that early. So 500 to in Europe, the Dark Age is considered the first part of the Middle Ages from about 500 to around 900. And then after that, you have a period we'll cover next week. And that's the Romanesque era. I'm not going to explain what that is because I'll give you that intro next week, of course. And that goes around 300 years, during which universities began to be uh, established. And there was trade with uh, foreign uh, powers like Islamic uh, kingdoms. And uh, some learning was returning to uh, those in the upper classes who could afford to get an education. But there was still plenty of it obviously, uh, of, of superstition and ignorance. And violence. That's the era of the Crusades, by the way. That's usually considered the high Middle Ages, and that's around 900 to 1200 AD. And then the last part is the part that most people, I think, uh, erroneously assume is all one thing, and that's the late Gothic period, when the cathedrals were built in Europe, the Gothic cathedrals specifically. And there was, a, printing presses were around, there was, a, you know, some learning at the beginning of a middle class, and there were beginning to be actual nations with unified governments. We'll get to that at the end. That's our last two weeks. Uh, I did, I'll say this, I did have a couple of students at the beginning of this semester, or even before the class started, say, so we're going to cover goth art? You mean like, you know, the goth lifestyle? <laughs> Not really. Uh, we're going to talk about... <laughs> That's an appropriation. There's cultural appropriation for you in a way that doesn't offend anybody. Right? It's okay to use the word God to describe black robed people walking around and talking strange things, whatever. Anyway, uh, my daughter briefly dyed her hair black and regretted it. That's as far as she went into that direction. Um, but anyway, in the meantime, um, you, you, you have three periods is the bottom line I'm saying. And we're gonna cover tonight the early medieval period. So that is the dark ages. And that is the period of, well, if you ever saw Monty Python's Holy Grail, if you didn't, still funny. How many is that? 40 years ago, they made that movie. Uh, Bring out your dead. Some of you know what I mean. Um, they, they do a spoof on what life was like in that period, the early middle ages or dark ages. Uh, so um, we will talk though about the works of art that are the exceptions because artists in every culture, as you all know, and many of you, I've been very impressed. I wanna say this about the artwork I've seen. Oh, I'm sorry, that is the extra fit. I think I, I didn't give you the fifth option of extra credit. If you wanna show me works of your own art, I'll say, I think let's limit it to uh, four. That's reasonable, uh, just like with the articles. You get five points for each one. You send me as a, a PDF image of any art that you created yourself, not anybody else's, because that's, you know, not the same thing. If you are creative in photography, uh, printmaking, sculpture, uh, a craft of some kind, that's art, that's visual art. Painting, obviously, uh, whether it's um, a watercolor, whatever. And you send me that and with, the, with the title of that work and of course your full name in the class, you get five points. So that's another good option. Very talented stuff I've been seeing. And both my parents were artists. I never, 
I didn't get those genes. I got the writing, uh, the writing gene. I don't know how to draw well. So if you want to do that, you don't forget, you get five points for each one of those works of art. You send me up to four of those. Okay. I remember him. Okay, so let us get to the beginning of the period right after the fall of Rome, when Europe was in the beginning of the Dark Ages. There yet had not been any advanced learning. That comes a little later during the latter part of the Dark Ages. But there was a lot of violence, and we're going to talk about the most uh, warlike culture of all, the Vikings, right? Or some people call them Norsemen. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we get to that must know slide toward the end. Okay, so let us now. Okay, any questions before we get started on, um, here we go, I'm exiting full screen. And uh, we'll be able to get, wait a minute, let's do the screen share. Let's see if that will come up. Yeah, here we go. Let's hope this just comes up full size. But, uh, Okay, can you guys see this? Yes. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So here we go. First must know. Need to take notes now. Um, this one is... Oh, when? No, actually. <laughs> I've had stories of him all my life. Uh, it isn't the first his one. Yeah, his memories, his lies, his death. Yeah. There we go. So hang on. Hang on. That's for next week, don't worry. You might be looking at it and say, wait a minute, that doesn't look like the purse cover. So I'm gonna have to go to that after we get to Okay, somebody is talking in the background. He I created know. himself as an artist. Or has a radio on or TV. I think you have to mute Carla. She's yeah, she's I guess thing of Okay. Um, oh, good. I think that stopped it. All right. I hope it did. All right. This is the first must know. My apologies. This is the first must know. I'm not cutting this one from the study list, so take extra careful notes. Okay. This is the purse cover. You know, two words, just like it sounds. Purse cover from, and the town it's from is Sutton Who. Again, two words. I'll spell that S U T T O N. H double O. Purse cover from Sutton Who. S U T T O N. Second word H double O. And the country, I know you know how to spell England, 630. Of course, these are all C E or A D. You can use either the common era, all of these slides for the rest of this semester. Okay, so what are we looking at? Why is it so important? I won't cut it for the study list. Well, this is a classic example of the animal style which you again, as always, should have in front of you your handout uh, with the terms to know. So for this week, animal style, and I put it in parentheses, medieval. If you have a memory back or throw your memory back to about the second or third week of the class, we had a version of the animal style from the ancient world. This is different. That's why when and if it appears on the true-false section as a question, that you know you have to say is it true or false you you know this from the midterm uh, then then i would say animal the medieval version of or animal style parentheses just like it is on this handout of terms to know medieval so you don't confuse it with the other version so what is that here's the definition everybody okay i'll say it and always repeat it slowly one other time so here we go animal style okay or the medieval version was a style of art in the Middle Ages, a style of art in the Middle Ages in which animals were used, okay, to depict the strength and power of the ruling classes in which animals animal images, I should say, but obviously I mean that. So you can either say in which animals or animal images were used to depict the strength and power of the ruling classes. That might seem odd as a, as a definition to some of you if you've never studied medieval art, but we're going to explain that. Okay, does anybody need me to repeat that? Okay. Yeah, please. Yes, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, okay, animal style 
and I put in parentheses medieval version, uh, was a style of art in the Middle Ages, comma, in which animals were used, right, were used to depict, right, the how strength and power of the ruling classes. Okay, period. So it's one sentence. What is that? Two lines. Okay, how does that fit this piece of jewelry? Sort of. What is it? It's a fanny pack or maybe a side pack where a king would have around their waist and of course it's missing the belt or whatever adhered it maybe it was a chain around their waist but it has all the features i've seen this piece it is remarkably beautiful so what are we looking at we're looking at a piece of it's bling you could say i don't mind you using that word in your notes or if it's on the exam which it could be because it won't be cut i remember i said that from the study list so make sure you study this one extra careful why is it so unusually important it's just another piece of uh fancy you know you could say jewelry or you know um in a way it's an a piece of attire but it's not clothing so it ha hangs from the king's uh belt or or waist and it would hold What's important about why this is considered to be one of the best examples of the animal style is first the purpose, and then we'll describe the details of the animals and what they're symbolizing. But first, what purpose was it used for? Well, a purse. Yes, real men carried purses in the Middle Ages. So the king would have this with him whenever he traveled. So what would he put inside it? That's what's really important about the first part of the meaning, the purpose. Well, he would have three things. His most valuable jewelry that he wanted to keep with him, you know, that he wanted to wear or had just have with him whenever he traveled. And, you know, a lot of these kings had more than one castle that they would stay at. So they might bring those things. Their most valuable jewelry would go inside this purse. Or really, it's a fanny pack, but the word purse is what Europeans call it. Okay, the second type of thing that a king would carry inside this uh, purse or pack uh, would be um, their most important documents, which would be, you know, letters or, or, you know, even treaties or whatever, any kind of document, receipts or, you know, bills for things that the king was trying to collect money for, you know, just say important documents, letters and other important documents that they wanted to have with them, especially if they were going somewhere where they're trying to collect a debt from another, you know, subject of theirs, you know, a Lord or something that owed the money or whatever. So just say, you can keep it simple, just say, the second thing they would have inside this verse would be important documents, uh, uh, including letters and other uh, documents. And then the third thing is their uh, signature ring. Now that won't ring a bell with some of you, unless you, well, some of this comes up in, uh, Narnia, is it? I'd never see those movies. But anyways, my daughter's mentioned, right? Some of the fantasy film franchises that have been around. A signature ring, some of you may know, is the uh, symbol or emblem. You could say it either way. Emblem or symbol of that king and their family, which is in metal, right? Almost all what it's they have to be made out of metal that they could wear when they want to seal a document. They put wax over the envelope yeah they had envelopes that they were handmade of course and not made out of paper you know made out of leather probably or, or parchment or something just say envelope or, or packet in which a document would go right or even the document itself folded over when they wanted to seal just keep it simple and say when they wish to seal a king in the early middle ages a document an important document they would use that ring their signature ring Many of them were illiterate. They couldn't even write their own name. But even if they, they, they were literate, they would sign their documents with that because no one else owned that ring except the king. And you'd know that document came from that king. And they would press it into the wax. When the wax dried, you got the signature in wax of that king, right, on that document. So again, the third thing is a signature ring, which the kings would use to uh, seal and sign. There we go. Seal and sign their important documents. So those are the kind of things that a king would carry with him. Now, the period this is from, as part of the meaning, is the Dark Ages. I just said that. But it's a period of, in England when uh, they were uh, not a unified kingdom yet. It, there were several warring kingdoms. So this is the southern. It comes from the southern part of England. 
uh, and it would have been wherever the king of that part of the of what's now England uh, would have had his castle. And they found it in his burial site. So it's at a museum now, you have to know that, but it's in a museum in London called the British Museum, that's where I saw it. So just say it was buried with the king who owned it, keep it simple, in his burial uh, site or his grave, right? But what the animal style have to do with it, well, look at what's going on where I'm putting these arrows. This is a really powerful image of the strength, right? And power of the king. This is a bird of prey. Look carefully. He's scooping the brains out of a weaker, smaller bird, which would symbolize his enemies or even perhaps a, a, a king, a rival king, right? So any enemy or subject, the king's own subjects, they didn't think of them as fairly human, if that. Then obviously there was no consideration for anybody's rights. The king is the only one that had rights, a king and maybe his immediate family had any rights. So, so this is symbolic of the ruling class in general, the king and his family, if you want to say the royal family, uh, you know, literally dominating a smaller, weaker creature, a smaller bird. So it's a, a large bird of prey uh, dominating or even killing. And that's what the, they're, it's, if you look closely, you can see, let's go up close. Let's see, I think that, yeah. Uh, this, this would be, of course, not this small bird here, the, the, the weaker one that's obviously in the clutches of the bird of prey. It doesn't have much longer to live if that is what's going on, that its brains are about to be scooped out by the stronger bird. Uh, and then over here we have, let's see, I think I can do this, let's move this, yeah. Another symbol of the strength and power of the ruling classes. These are dogs, like royal hunting dogs that would protect the royal uh, compound or royal grounds, you can say the, the king's grounds, you know, around their estate or all of their castles. Like I said, some of them had multiple castles. So if this poor guy wandered in or was trying to poach, you know, or steal game because he was hungry, he wanted to feed his family or whatever reason, uh, he doesn't have very long to live either. He's about to get eaten or at least killed, torn to pieces by these two powerful dogs that are as big as he is, the king would have ordered someone to set the dogs on any intruder is what's happening. So these are dogs that are guarding the king's property or grounds of the king's uh, estates, and they are attacking an intruder. And there again, that's part of the animal style, the medieval version, because clearly it indicates the strength and power of the uh, ruling class, specifically the king and his immediate family. So another way of saying that in a single short phrase of what these animal style details, these two sets of details, you see that's duplicated brilliantly. I mean, considering this is all made by hand with no you know, modern tools, that's a really well done piece of artwork. It really is. I mean, they're almost exactly the same images. Uh, in any case, the point is there's two sets of the same two creatures and then both sets of each of those sets of creatures, the birds and the dogs, the uh, weaker person is being overcome or, or uh, killed <laughs> by the more powerful one. So the other way to say it is the philosophy this symbolizes this, this whole idea of the king having all the power and the animal style symbolizing that is might makes right. You've heard that phrase, right? And there are people that run their countries that way today, <laughs> like uh, Belarus is a good example, right? A few other places in the world. Um, anyway, the point is might makes right was the entire concept of the ruling classes and the way uh, European societies were run back then in the uh, early Middle Ages. That starts to change in the late Middle Ages, the Gothic era. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. Okay, so that's the whole meaning. Oh, well, some people ask about this. These are dragons. Funny looking dragons, I know, but there's at least the two on the outer edge. I think actually, no, they're all four of them are. Dragons are uniquely universal or, or a just a universal symbol of the strength again and power of rulers. The Chinese use them if you take art 1.2, which I'm teaching next semester, uh, or um, you know, any other world art class anywhere in any college, you'll see that. Or if you travel, as I have to China, you'll see it in their artwork. Um, you know, it's, 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 it was also, uh, dragons were popular in, of course, uh, Arabic cultures. In this same period, we are talking about by 630, Muhammad had already established the early beginnings of an Arab empire. We covered that last, uh, well, two weeks ago. 
Uh, so they were beginning to form cities and, and universities. Well, Europe was stuck in the Dark Ages, as we discussed. So during this period, in uh, almost every, in fact, there were dragon-like creatures in pre-Columbian or um, you know pre-Hispanic uh, or in Central America, of course, Aztec and, and uh, Mayan and other. Uh, you know, there are cultures that go way back civilizations that go way back before that. And we don't cover that in this class because it's just about Western art. But I really like showing the slides I took when I was in Mexico, exploring those kinds of sites. And some of you have been there, I'm sure, to parts of uh, Central America or Southern Mexico where the Mayan cities were, but there's older cities than the Mayans even. So they, many of those cultures believe dragons were a good symbol for the ruling classes to associate themselves with. So that's what that is. Okay, so let's now do a formal analysis. Uh, first of all, this is gold. What looks like gold, it really is gold. That's all warm, as are the red. And what's the red? It's garnet, actually a birthstone. I think it's for people born in January. I can't remember. It doesn't matter. Just say it's the red and that stone. The red color is, is, is uh, garnet, G-A-R-N-E-T. And that's obviously warm. So the only thing's cool are the blue, which is lapis lazuli. Some of you remember from the um, uh, funerary mask of King Tut that the Egyptians liked that blue stone. They're the first culture to use it in their funeral art. Well, this isn't funeral art. This is just colors that the artist and or the king that hired him liked. Um, and so the blue is cool, very little of that though. And then the background, that's not the original background. That's what the museum has put behind it, but it probably had some kind of a off-white color of you know, some kind of uh, leather or something, perhaps that was, we don't know. We don't know what the background was. So that's not really part of the original piece. But if you looked at it on the exam and you said that the background is cool, you, you get credit for that because that's what it looks like. Okay, but the only thing in the original part that we know is, is it was the way it was originally, or the, that's cool, or the blue in inlay. That's what the right word is, inlaid stones. And you don't have to know what they are, but they're lapis lazuli, if you want to write that, L-A. P-I-S-L-A-Z-U-L-A. Okay, so the colors, mostly warm, a little bit of cool. Rhythm, uh, well, everywhere you look, the geometric patterns on the purely geometry designs, and then the dragons and the animals, uh, the dogs, the uh, hapless human <laughs> poacher or whatever he is, intruder getting eaten. Uh, there's just the same shapes that are repeated throughout the entire piece. Even the clasps here, right, uh, are the same shape. Uh, the uh, simulated texture, it does have simulated texture on the feathers for the birds here. And I would even argue on the hair, the buzz cut, and the mustache of this intruder about to be eaten by dogs. Um, there, there's some hint, maybe even his own belt. So there's little bits of uh, simulated texture, mostly on the two uh, sets of birds, the four birds in the center. Uh, and that's, of course, done with is it painted line? No, it's, you know, it's almost impossible to say it exactly. It's not painted. You could say sculpted line because this was made uh, by someone who knew how to make gold into figures, which are in essence sculptural, you know, flat versions of uh, sculpture, uh, two-dimensional, right? Uh, figures that stand out from the background, so they're bas-relief. This is in essence a bas-relief piece. Uh, okay, so you could just say the lines are thick and bold. You don't have to say how they made them. Uh, right? I don't see any thin lines here. Not really. Maybe a little bit in these two pieces on either end. Yeah. But most of the lines are thick and bold. Okay. And then we have dynamic. There isn't a straight line in it unless you can, you count a few of these up here, uh, I guess, some of these lines. But here, even here, they kind of curve over, you know, along with the outer uh, border. Uh, so mostly uh, like 90% uh, dynamic or curved lines with a little bit of stability in some of the uh, border area. Okay, and then we have the largest mass. Well, it's hard to say. I think it would be because it's wider, this set of figures, the two dogs devouring the intruder or poacher, and then the two sets of birds. But it's a close call. You could even make the case that uh, this piece is, uh, these two end pieces are the second largest. So you be the judge. Okay, and then for space, it's just only overlapping. No other technique, right? These larger birds overlap the smaller ones, the dogs are about to overlap or just already are, right, the upper body of the intruder there. So only overlapping, no other techniques for space. 
uh, balance. It's completely, that's what's so brilliant about it. I mean, it's an amazingly uh, detailed and sophisticated or refined, you could use either word, composition because this far back, you know, they didn't have a lot of tools to measure things. And uh, so they, somehow the artist visually managed to make it really carefully, completely balanced. And I would say both top to bottom and left to right, because look, you can see it that way. So it's balanced both ways. Okay, uh, and then there's no modeling. There's, there's no technique for modeling. Um, let's see, I will give you one hint. If you go to see this, how many of you are planning to go? Probably not, but once they open up the museums in Europe again, and they will, if you go to this, it's the British Museum in London, one of the most incredible museums for ancient and medieval art anywhere on earth. Uh, after all, the British Empire had, you know, three-eighths of the globe under its rule. That's a big chunk, almost half of the uh, globe for a couple hundred years in their empire. So a lot of the art from those countries, not legally anymore, we would consider it legal. But back then, there wasn't any, you know, rules about this, at least, that were enforced. They, they had pieces from all over the world brought to that museum. But this is their own culture, right? It's one of their early kings. So if you go see this, it's in a glass case. It's so valuable that I didn't know there was an infrared, I kind of should have guessed, infrared invisible, of course, um, you know, beams that guard it. So I was about to look at it. I'd already been teaching here for years. This is like, oh, four. I've been teaching it the JC for about eight years by then. And I just wanted to get a look at it. I wasn't going to try and, you know, touch the case or take a photo of it. I, I figured they wouldn't like that. But I leaned over just a little bit to get a better look and the alarms went off and these two armed guards, they had guns. They came up to me, two Brits with their, I said, step away from the case, sir. <laughs> oh yeah, I complied immediately. <laughs> I wasn't escorted out of the museum when I explained to them, I wasn't trying to do any harm to it. So be careful about any work of art. That's also true of the uh, painting uh, in the Chicago Art Institute of, um, both Paris Rainy Day, the two largest uh, impressionist paintings ever made, and the other one, Sunday on La Grande Jatte, you know, with a pointillism. Some of you know what I'm talking about. We cover that in our 2.3 and, and uh, 1.2, which I'm teaching next semester, uh, impressionism. Yeah, those two paintings, they also are protected by infrared. So just assume that in any museum with valuable works of art, you just can't get more than about, of course, they may have a sign, but if they don't, figure stay at least five feet away to be safe, or, or four anyway. <laughs> Because at three feet, the alarm went off. All right, enough on that. Now, the next must know. Uh, this is one I'm not going to say it's so important, I'm not going to cut it, but it does bring up another definition. Okay, it's stag staff. That's S T A F F. Stag, I think, you know, has one G. If you spell it with two, I've seen it spelled with two, but really it should be the way it is in the syllabus. And that's the only, we have to have a common uh, reference point. And so, whatever the spelling and the dates and the syllabus are, is what you should use on the exams uh, for any of these must knows that appear on the final. Stag with one G staff, S T A F F, from the same place, but I'll spell it again Sutton Hoop. S U T T O N and then H, capital H, double O. Again, of course, England, yes, same year, 630. Well, it was found in the same burial site, uh, along with the king's others valuable, same king that we just talked about who had the uh, purse cover. But here he had a, a piece of stone that was attached to the staff that he carried while he was on his throne, literally. Whenever he was on his throne, he would carry a staff. So that definition is quite short, but here it is. A staff is a, uh, a stick, a long, narrow, I'm sorry, you're say a long, narrow stick made of wood or metal, which symbolize the authority of a king or queen, could be either. A long, narrow uh, stick made of wood or stone, which symbolize the authority of a king. So all kings, while they were in public, would carry that, not every minute while they're walking or entering a room, but when they're sitting on their throne, they were supposed to have this with them, usually, you know, uh, whichever they had, the right hand or their left hand, if they were right-handed, of course, uh, would be in their right hand. So this is the end piece of a staff. In other words, the a piece, and we think it was wood, because that's what most uh, early medieval kings in England had, is wooden staffs, about two feet long, would stretch out this way, where I'm 
drawing the uh, cursor back. And then it was probably attached with a metal clamp to this piece of stone as a piece of decoration. So you have to do a little bit of, uh, you know, imagination here, use your imagination. If the, if the staff was, you know, whatever, let's say about two feet, they were usually about that long, then the last part of it would be horizontal at a uh, right angle to the top of the staff it's attached to. So this piece would stick out facing the audience, the people he was talking to while he's on his throne. I think everybody can visualize that, right? So now I'm gonna say, what else could that be used for? We just said the main purpose of a staff is to symbolize the power of the king. So it could be quite fancy. This one was obviously very fancy because he hires some sculptor fairly skilled. We're gonna talk about the details in a minute to uh, create a stag. So what else could you, anybody think uh, King might use this piece for, depending on uh, the mood he was in or the emotions he was feeling while he was talking to someone in front of him? So heat people. Yes, they did that, exactly. <laughs> You're gonna hear that story at the end of tonight and when we, we will end early with the uh, last light of the Russian cathedral in Moscow. It's a true story about the czar of Russia and what a tragic incident that was. We'll get to that at the end. I'll save that and hopefully uh, tweaks your curiosity. So I don't know that this king ever hit anybody, but yes, they could. Because remember, there's nobody else had the power to tell the king what to do. And so if he wanted to kill somebody or just harm them, injure them permanently, you know, blind them or maim them, it, he could get away with it. And... Um, there were more than a few kings, not most didn't do that, but uh, kings could use this as a weapon, in other words, if they felt so inclined, because they could literally do damage. You can see why. Look at the prongs on these horns. By the way, I don't know, in Santa Rosa, actually, I'm going to ask this. Do you guys have deers coming down from the hills? We have them in my neighborhood in North Berkeley, which is not a rural area. I don't know if you know Berkeley, so like Solano Avenue, the north edge of uh, Berkeley city limits, it runs into Albany and down onto the, toward the freeway. Anyway, I live in the part that's not up in the hills, okay? It's a good mile below the nearest hillside streets that run in the hill. Well, let's say two, three quarters of a mile. And we have a stag who's guarding his doe living across the street from me in the backyard of one of my neighbors. And if I take my evening walk after I teach this class, which is usually around 9, 30, 10 when it's over, I often meet up with them. And sometimes right on the sidewalk within a few feet or doors of my own front door, that stag is as tall as I am. <laughs> Intimidating, you know? <laughs> so anyway, that's why the king picked this. Back to the notes, now you should take this. Obviously didn't need to write that. Uh, th this would have not only been a symbol of the king's power and, you know, the total power he had over all his subjects and a possible weapon for use by the king, but it also is a classic example of the animal style. How so? Some of you can guess already. What is a stag? The alpha male of that herd. Is it called a herd? I don't know. A group, right, of, of uh, deer. Obviously, the most powerful and therefore dominant member of any group of deer is the stag in that group. And that's what the king saw himself as. So of course, he would have thought of this as a perfect symbol for himself and the power he had over everyone in his kingdom. So this would be about two, uh, no, actually it's more about four inches long. Pretty good size, right? Uh, and it would have been attached where it's missing. Obviously that's where someone broke it or something. Who knows, maybe the grave was, disturbed. But anyway, the archaeologists found it, I guess, for some reason, it was still in the grave when they found the rest of it, like the purse that we just saw. And it's also at the British Museum in London. So this would have been where the staff ended, and it would have been clamped somehow, probably with metal, uh, how else would they have done that, the stone decorative end piece on top of the wooden staff, and then held upright, but that would have put the uh, antlers or horns, antlers is the right word, right, of this stag pointing outwards menacingly towards anyone the king was talking to. So it might also give them, the audiences of the king, the people coming to talk to him, a pause to not anger him, <laughs> not say anything he wouldn't like. Okay, formal analysis on this is pretty easy. Now that, let me see, I might have another version of it. I don't, no, I don't, yeah. Uh, this is not the actual color of it. I guess she only could get a black and white photo, but that's all right. Uh, it is actually a warm liver color. I know it looks cool here, so I, if I use it, I'm not saying I will. 
I'm, uh, uh, we'll see when we do the review if I'm going to cut it or not. But the point is that it uh, it, it is a, an actual warm liver, literally liver color, kind of brown stone. But if you looked at this and you forgot that, I wouldn't take points off because it looks like it's a cool gray stone, but it isn't. It's warm brown or liver color. Then we have, uh, it's a single mass. There's no larger, smaller masses. Uh, for space, it's a real three-dimensional object. There is no technique for space, so it's a little over four inches. I think it's like four and a half, actually. I remember reading that. From the feet to the top of the uh, antler, about four and a half inches. It's balanced. Well, yeah, it's a creature with its uh, legs, you know, close together, but they're, all four legs are there, standing straight upright. So it's balanced and it's dynamic on the horns, but everything else is stable. Look, that's a totally 90 degree angle. The head uh, connecting to the neck, the legs are, and the back, that's all right angles. So it's mostly stable except for the antlers. But what I like, and let's go up close, is the personality. Look, you can see the eye here below the uh, ears and a mouth with an expression, almost like, you know, uh, some kind of, uh, you know, happy or joyful expression over whatever the, 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 the stag happens to be looking at. And then there's even a nose, uh, let's just go back to that, uh, kind of a sense of so nostrils. It, it's very skilled for, for 600 AD, it's, it's remarkably so. So there is line, carved line on the face only, right? Well, I think maybe on the bottom of the feet, let's go up close. No, not really. So it's only on the face. Um, and then we have, uh, let's see, uh, the rhythm, of course, with the two antlers, the two ears, the two eyes, uh, the legs. There's a lot of rhythm. Uh, and then we have, uh, let's see, no modeling. It's just the shadows from the museum. I th oh, texture. Now, see, I forgot texture on that last one. I'll go back to it. But first, to finish up this one, the texture here is the smooth texture of the stone, except the antlers. That's the only place where the artist actually created rough simulated texture. As you know, antlers are not smooth. I forgot to mention these textures here. Actually, I did, didn't I? Yeah, I did. I did. Simulated textures were on just the, you know, the birds and then maybe the belt and, and uh, buzz cut of the intruder. So that's, that's right, we did. Okay, moving on. This is the next must know. We're doing really well on time here. Okay, um, this one, the third must know for tonight, cross page of Lindisfarne Gospel. I'll have to spell, of course, uh, some of those words. Cross, you know, as in the cross from the Bible. Page, of course, you all know how to spell that. Lindisfarne is the city in England where it came from. L I N. D-E-S-F-A-R-N. Again, L-I-N-D-E-S-F-A-R-N. Lindisfarne. Gospel, which means Bible, is the last word. is G-O-S-P-E-L. G-O-S-P-E-L. England location. And this is 700. So it's still in the Dark Ages. All the stuff tonight is, except for the uh, um, St. Basil's, but there are people who would claim that was the Russian Dark Ages. We'll get to that when we end that with the last slide later in a little bit. Okay, so what are we looking at this for? Well, it's 700 AD, so it's still the Dark Ages, and this is an example of the animal style, but used a little bit differently than kings or rulers would have. So let's start out with the fact, the last of the three new definitions for tonight, it's up there, is illuminated manuscripts. It's on your handout, so I don't need to spell that. Two words, right? E with an I, I L, L, right? Illuminated manuscripts. What is that? That's not too long a definition. Here we go. Um, illuminated manuscripts were hand drawn texts, handwritten. Sorry, I'm all right. I'll start over. Handwritten texts, T E X T S, right? Handwritten texts created by monks in a monastery, M-O-N-K-S, you probably know that, right? Handwritten texts created by monks in a monastery. They were the only people that knew consistently how to read. They were the only uh, educated class, comma, sorry, that's only half of handwritten texts created by monks in a monastery with richly illustrated uh, pages throughout the manuscript. 
with richly illustrated pages throughout the manuscript. And each of those pages would have a purpose or meaning, right? Doesn't mean every page was illustrated. Obviously, there was text. So you might go 20 pages and not see an illustration. So just say throughout the manuscript, that just means every, every whatever chapter or so, after all, the Bible is divided into what is it, a thousand? I haven't seen one in years, but anyway, it's a long book. So, you know, you could have dozens of these illustrations. So I'll say it again one more time. Illuminated manuscripts were uh, handwritten texts created by monks in a monastery, comma, with richly illustrated pages throughout the manuscript. Okay, so this is one of those pages. It's the first illustrated page. It's called a frontispiece. Those uh, of, of you who do read actual physical books, some people still do, you know what I'm talking about. It's the first illustration once you open up the cover. So this is the first illustration inside a Bible. Gospel is a Bible. So it's the first thing you'll see the first illustration you'll see if you were to open this Bible, all done by hand by monks in a monastery. So why is it part of the animal style? Well, let's go up close. Look closely. These are snakes. And over here are birds being crushed by snakes. Now, I don't know what bird would be slow enough to, <laughs> but I understand there are some in South America. Some of my friends who've been down to Brazil tell me. But anyway, just say that these are snakes. You don't have to get too detailed. Uh, curling around birds and then just snakes with no birds inside the cross. Of course, the reason it's called a cross page is because it's the first page in a Bible which has the largest object is the cross, the Christian cross, of course, here, right? And inside and outside the cross, inside are snakes, outside are a combination of snakes and birds. But what's that have to do with the animal style? Well, everything. Because the purpose of this using these animals on a uh, cross page or any illustration inside a Bible is to symbolize, here's the main part, part of the meaning, it's to symbolize the dominance of Christianity over the old pagan religions. And I did tell you that word would come in handy, and if this were to be on the final, you would want to use that word, right? Pagan, non-Christian. E-A-G-A-N. Yes, there are plenty of pagans now. I know some of them proudly display themselves or, or uh, describe, I bet, themselves as pagans. Uh, you know, just a few people my daughter knows, for instance, in her high school. Okay, so I'll say it again. Uh, th this would have been an example of the animal style applied to a page from a Bible because here uh, the symbolism is that Christianity has become dominant over the old pagan religions. The old pagan religions might have worshipped these animals and nothing else, or maybe some other gods that were not part of the Bible, you know, in other words, pre-Christian uh, beliefs. But the dominant symbol is the cross. Look at it. I'll go back to the full. You see, it dominates the whole page, of course, and it's overlapping the animals. So once again, it symbolizes the dominance of Christianity over the old religions. 700 AD, it hadn't been very long before in the, that. I mean, maybe, well, it depends on where you were, but some parts of England barely had converted, been converted, usually by a sword, by force, but at this point, it was usually an invasion by some bishop and his army, or a king who was Christian and wanted to convert other parts of his realm that weren't already Christian. So just say, whatever the reasons were, you can just say, uh, England had only recently been completely converted the British Isles, actually, uh, to Christianity, which would include, of course, Scotland, Wales, and uh, one Ireland. So the British Isles, the whole what's now British Isles are called, of course, UK, right? The United Kingdom or Great Britain, you can say it either way. So you can say what is now Great Britain, those islands are called the British Isles, had just recently been converted to Christianity. And that's what this symbolizes, that fact that the monks were making a statement with this illustrated uh, illuminated manuscript, this this particular page. And then they also were using purely geomet geometric symbols. It's, it's quite, it's, this would have taken months to create, months. And it might have been worked on by more than one monk, not at the same time, but maybe all today, but probably easy one monk was assigned to each page. It's beautiful. And it's uh, in one, I forget which museum, it's probably the British Museum, but it's some yeah. museum in Britain. Yes, question. Yeah, uh, why snakes when, you know, this kind of symbolizing Christianity like a, a bath 
you know. Okay, I think I know. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I know, but if anyone wants to chime in, again, I always welcome participation of students. So it's a good question. Um, St. Patrick, supposedly, the first Christian missionary, he was supposedly a bishop. So I guess, yeah, he had the authority to come from Rome, right, where there was by this time a pope. A few hundred years earlier, I think it was 200 years or anyway, just say, you know, a couple centuries earlier, there was a story, you can call it a myth, because that's probably what it is, that when he arrived on the shores of Ireland, and then later it went to Scotland, did the same thing, to convert the local people who were pagan at that time to Christianity, they were plagued by snakes. I don't know what the snakes got in their houses. I don't know the details. But anyway, apparently it was a whole bunch of snakes that were bothering the population. And as a miracle to prove Christianity was the religion they should adopt, he banished the snakes with a, um, I don't know, a prayer or something. And so snakes were symbolic of the earlier period of pre-Christian or pagan times. And so they are now dominated, as you can see, by the Christian cross that overlaps them. The power of the church. Anybody see The Exorcist? the movie, <laughs> The Power of Christ Compelled You. I'm not going to get religious here. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know some of you what I'm talking about. But what you believe in, that's your business. Whatever. But there are people today who hire themselves out, and they're mostly Catholic priests that are uh, or officially uh, designated by the Catholic Church to be able to do this, to get rid of evil spirits. Well, I guess the snakes were symbolic of evil. So that's what they're saying. You could say it that way. The snake symbolized the earlier pagan culture, which was looked down upon as evil uh, or sinful. Same thing in some people's minds, uh, evil or uh, sinful by, by, by the um, Christian church, which at that time was Catholic. There were, there were no Protestants, of course. So you could say the, the Christian church or Catholic church was uh, showing with this illustration that they had banished evil and dominated it. But you know, the truth is, in a way, one last thing in the, that, that you're, you're bringing to my mind. I know from my own reading, and some of you may know from, I don't know, history you may have taken, or if you travel to these areas, I have friends who are history teachers, professors, writers in, in different parts of the British Isles, including the British Museum, a couple of people that work there. Um, the, the pagan religions weren't totally gone. The people still quietly, you know, shh, don't tell the bishop, don't, don't tell the priest at, on Sunday, but I have this pagan, you know, ritual that I do at home because I want to cover my bases. I'm going to pray to the Christian God when I'm in their church, but I'm also going to pray at home to the old pagan gods that my grandfather used to pray to. You know what I'm saying? The pagan gods hadn't totally disappeared from the culture of the British Isles is what I'm saying. Not totally. So the church was trying to show that, oh, but they weren't right. They were, you know, sinful or evil or bad. So we are now dominant. You should just think about us and what we teach. It's, it's political as well as a religious symbolism right? So it's the good point you raised, yeah. Uh, so snakes were symbolic of the earlier pagan cultures, which some people, even after converting Christianity, still secretly worshipped in their homes. They wouldn't do it openly because they'd get in trouble, uh, but they could do it in their privacy of their own homes or out in the woods somewhere. <laughs> so, that, you know, this is why they're saying this, the, the people who created this Bible, you shouldn't do that. You should look at the cross and think only of the teachings of the, the Christian church. Okay, plenty on the meaning. Formal analysis. Well, this is a, obviously a mixture of cool and warm. The red on the cross, the borders of the cross, and the outer border here, at least part of it. Creative collab, what is that? Okay, that's not. <laughs> anyway, the point is that, that that's all, of course, warm. And the snakes are a mixture of pink and blue. So obviously the blue snakes, blue and green, actually. Green inside the cross, blue uh, outside. And are the uh, cool colors and the, uh, you know, pink snakes are warm. So you got a mixture almost equally between cool and warm. Uh, here there is, I think, let's go up close, not really any similar texture. It's implied, but it's not, not really, there's no detail here. But there is line, thin line around the animals, bold line around the cross and the border. So both bold and thin lines. The techniques here for space is only one overlapping. The snakes overlap each other and the birds, the cross overlaps all of the animals. So overlapping is it. And then this is balanced left to right, but unbalanced toward the top, right? If you draw the line right across the middle, there's more, the cross is more of it above the, uh, middle in the top half. So it's unbalanced toward the top and totally balanced or symmetrical left to right. The largest mass, easy, the cross. Then I guess it's a close call between the decorative details along the border 
and then maybe the snakes and last will be the birds in that order. Okay, and uh, as I said, there is no semantic texture, there's no modeling. Um, and it's dynamic on the snakes and birds and the, uh, the uh, outer edge of the cross, but the cross itself, the border of the cross, I'm sorry, is stable because it's at right angles, as is the border, the outer border of the page itself. So it's both stable and dynamic. Um, okay, I think that is everything on this one. Let's see, am I forgetting anything? Yeah, no texture, right? And no modeling. Okay. All right. There's a lot to say about this one. Um, this is the next must know. Ships head two words, you know, with an apostrophe, but I think I didn't put that on the syllabus, so you'd be given credit if you wrote just S-H-I-P-S, but it should have an apostrophe. Ship's head from Oseberg, O-S-E-B-E-R-G, one word. It's a city, Oseberg, O-S-E-B-E-R-G. Again, the title, Ship's Head from Oseberg. The location is the country, Norway, 820. A.D. or just 820. We don't have to write the letters after this. This is all a common error. I think I know the answer to this, but it can't hurt to ask. Well, first, there are only three, no, four, four countries in all of Europe I haven't been to. One of them is Norway. Anybody here been to Norway or have Norwegian heritage? Okay, well, the reason I'm asking is, even if you don't, some of you will know this. There's a great series. One of my readers, uh, the one I've worked with the longest, uh, she and her fiance watch every, I think it's Friday, I don't remember, certain day of the week, once a week. Uh, I think it's on Netflix, I can't remember, or Showtime, about uh, the Norsemen, the Vikings, uh, and, and all of that culture. So what is this? Well, let's start with the fact that the title is misleading, but I don't want to confuse you because that's what's in Stockstead in case you're creating flashcards like some of you did to study for the um, midterm, or you might also, again, whatever, for, for, for the final. Uh, I'll go with her title unless it's just so far off. Uh, but this, it's misleading. This is only four inches long. There's no way this was the actual end piece on the prow of a Viking longboat. So let's say what it really is. It's the model, a small piece of bone. Here are the facts you should be writing. <clears throat> okay, a piece of bone about four and a half inches long, carved as the model, you could say, right, to be used as a model for a much larger wooden head, which then was attached to the front or prowl, the right word is prowl, right? The front of a Viking longboat. Those words are pretty self-explanatory. Some of you know, if you've seen any pictures of Viking uh, warriors in their longboats, what those boats look like. You don't have to know that for, to get nay on the, or full credit if this is on the uh, midterm essay part. But if you didn't know what that is, those are the boats they use to travel all over the world. That is not a minor point. That is a major point. If you start thinking about what the world was like in the, I just described, in Europe, especially the Dark Ages, that's when this culture began to rise in what's now Scandinavia, around 700 AD. And by 800, the Vikings, other people call them Norse, N-O-R-S-E-M-A-N. You can use either word, but Viking is a more common term using the capital V and Norseman with a capital N. So the Viking or Norse culture was a warlike culture, which they were also very skilled uh, woodcarvers and goldsmiths. They were also, the most important fact about them, the greatest navigators in the world up until that time. And I'll prove that to you. If you didn't know that already, the proof is in what they achieved. Okay, so we say they were warlike. What does that mean? We'll do each of the elements one at a time, each of the three characteristics of Norse or Viking culture. Well, um, they invaded almost every single kingdom in Europe, certainly every coastal culture or society on the coast of, uh, did I say England? I hope I didn't, uh, Europe. They went all the way around in their Viking boats their long boats with their warriors, you know, armed to the teeth, uh, which when they invaded any shoreline or in many cases, they went up the rivers and invaded the interior. They went all the way to Paris 
because you know theirs is in the middle of the northern half of France. It's nowhere near the coast, and they even got to um, almost what's Moscow now in Russia. Look how far that is from uh, Norway. Um, so they invaded ev almost every part of the European continent, uh, and when they invaded, they almost always succeeded in conquering that kingdom or that city. And so when they fought battles, they almost never lost. There was an old saying, you have to write this, but this is just a, you know, a footnote on that fact. They were the fiercest and most uh, victorious or successful, you could say warriors in uh, medieval European culture or in early medieval uh, dark ages of the Europe. Um, they used to say, when the Vikings come uh, uh, to your town or attack you, you have two choices, surrender or die. <laughs> And that turned out to be pretty true. They would take over a town or a castle, um, a whole kingdom, even if they had enough soldiers to, to do it, or they weren't soldiers, they were warriors. Uh, they were more, you know, kind of free form <laughs> fighters rather. They didn't march, you know, or anything like that. So really soldiers isn't the right word, but warriors. When their warriors came, if they had big enough numbers, they could take over a whole kingdom. But sometimes all they wanted was just one castle or one city, but they would almost always succeed in every invasion that they ever launched. Okay, the second thing about them, well, this proves that. Look how detailed this piece of bone bone is hard to carve, right? It's been damaged, but that's not from the, you know, the artist here. It's a carved piece of bone, and that's the museum's uh, mounting thing. That's not part of the original thing. Um, it's probably glued to this. So this would have then been a very, very hard thing to look how skilled that carving is, how intricate, how detailed. So they were skilled wood carvers. You could say carvers, period, because this is bone, wood and bone, but they usually use wood for most of their, their ships were all wood and their ship's heads on the front of each ship were usually something like this. What is this though? That's part of the meaning. We don't know. Is it a dragon? It kind of looks like a dragon, right? Is it a, a demon-like dog? You know, is it a sea serpent? Uh, is it a, a, a mythical creature we can't identify or maybe none of the above? Nobody knows because there's no written records. They didn't, they didn't write things down, the Vikings. They, they were not a literary culture or literate culture, uh, but they weren't, uh, you know, uh, unaware of the world around them. They had to be to do the last of the three things I was about to get to, which is their navigational skills. But to finish up on that, the other thing they were skilled at besides carving wood and bone uh, is, is uh, gold. You'd have to say goldsmiths, you know, that's the right word, people who work with gold. They were superb at that, uh, but they use other metals too. So you could just say metalsmiths or uh, working with metals, particularly gold. They could create all kinds of jewelry, of course, and, and ornate decorative pieces, but they also were really good at creating weapons, of course, for them to use. So they're the greatest metalsmiths is probably the better word than goldsmiths because it wasn't only gold uh, in Europe at that time. And what about the third thing? How can we say, that uh, they were the, or why do we say that they were the greatest navigators on earth at that time? Because here's what they achieved. This is the last part of the meaning you should be writing. Not only did they travel all around the coastline and into the interior of Europe, they also invaded the Middle East, Russia, which was really, it's now considered part of Europe, but it wasn't back then. It was mostly an Asian culture. After most of Russia is in Asia. They, in, they uh, invaded the interior of Russia from both the north and the south. Wait a minute, Russia's all plains, right? Prairie, in essence. They call it steppes, but it's the same thing as the Midwest in this country, right? The, the rural Midwest, right? So how did they get there with their boats? They carried the boats on their backs across hundreds of miles until they got to the next river or lake or bay. An amazing feat. Those are heavy boats. You ever seen pictures of them? <laughs> These were strong people. But the most amazing thing is, is that they crossed the Atlantic before anyone else and they founded colonies. If you didn't know this, you'd be writing it on the coast of New England and Canada on the Atlantic coast. There's proof of that. It used to be thought as a, be a myth or a theory or unproved. We now know there are foundations of stone buildings built by Viking settlers in 900 to 1100. They didn't necessarily stay 200 years in any one place, but they were in areas of what's now New England and the uh, east coast of Canada 
and they actually formed towns. And eventually they gave up because they couldn't make them profitable and it was too far from home and all. Look how far that is. With those long boats, it, they, these boats were much smaller than the one Columbus or ones, was it three? Columbus used to cross the Atlantic 500 years later. Uh, yeah, 500 years. So in the late 900s, you can say it that way, or 10th century, same thing, right? They uh, landed on the coast of the East Coast of North America. You just say it that way, but actually both what's now New England or Northeastern US, right? And Canada and settled and for generations. They had towns, some small ones, they're really more like villages in which they traded with the locals, which would be of course, the Native American tribes. And they fought wars with them as you could imagine. And eventually they just packed up and left. But the proof is there, there's no, it's not a theory. That hadn't been achieved by any other uh, culture period, <laughs> not the Arab cultures, not the Romans, not the other medieval European cultures. Uh, they were the first to cross the Atlantic from the Eastern Hemisphere. Okay, that's plenty on the meaning of this. We don't know exactly what kind of creature this is, but here we go, animal style again. See, there's snakes. Like, some people think these are snakes. It's hard to say for sure, but they do have that kind of a look. To, see, that looks like the head of a snake. So they're probably snakes, and that would make this, the creature itself is some kind of an animal, right? Probably. I mean, what else? You know, mythical or, or real or blend of both. Uh, so we see the animal style applied to what? The strength and power of Viking warrior culture or the warriors who use this as a model to create the head piece, right? Uh, that would be on the end of their boats, the prow of their boats. The real piece would be about four or five feet long. This is four, four and a half to five inches long. So it's not the actual ship's head. <laughs> it should say model of a ship's head or something, but anyway, a uh, miniature of a ship's head, but we'll go with her title. Okay, let's do the formal analysis balanced. Yes, I would say both, because depending on where you draw the line, you could certainly make the case there's, you know, if you draw right about here, equal mass left to right and top to bottom, I would say, roughly balanced. Of course, it's full of the rhythm of the intertwining snakes and the uh, eye ball and eyelid. That's a strange looking eyelid. It almost looks like abstract modern art, doesn't it? It's amazing for that far back. The snout here, you know, on the nose. Uh, the nose leather, if you have a cat or a dog at home, you know what nose leather is, right? Uh, here it's stylized to the point where it's, again, abstract almost. But the lips have actual texture. So there is texture here, simulated on the lips, the nose, and uh, I would say the snakes. Yeah, the snakes the, to have some hint of a leathery-like texture. So there is simulated texture. There's modeling, of course, because of the shadows created by the uh, deep, indentations the carver created so the modeling is actually part of the design here but now it's from the museum lights of course there is painted and carved line that might not be obvious but that's painted probably done with some kind of dye of course not ink they didn't have ink that far back so some kind of dye is used as well as the carved line so both carved and uh, painted lines it's totally dynamic i don't see a straight line in it I would call it a single mass. I don't really think you can break it down into different masses. Um, and for space, it's a real three-dimensional object. The snakes do overlap each other. You could say there's that one technique. But overall, the piece in general as a single object is just a real three-dimensional object in real space, about four and a half inches long. The color is warm. It's a warm yellowish color, right, of, of the uh, bone. In this case, that's that's actually an accurate photo of the color of this piece. Okay, um, so let's see, did I miss anything? I think that's everything here. Okay, we've got one more must know. And um, let's see, I'm trying to decide between these two, whether I'm going to make this, one, there will be just this or one, the last one, that will be ones I won't cut from the study list. Um, oh. We're going to cross the door. Sorry, I almost forgot. Take your pens. If you don't have them out handy, I'll give you a moment. And cross off the second from the bottom. It's the one I told you was particularly boring and not very, you know, uh, much meaning to it. It's just promoting the reputation of a local bishop in some small town in Germany. Okay. 
It's in a museum now. Doors of Bishop Bernawald at St. Michael's. Just cross it out. It won't be on the exam. We're not going to cover tonight. Okay, everybody got that? The second from the bottom from tonight's list under week uh, 13, of course, is Doors of Bishop Bernawald at St. Michael's. Just cross it off. We're not going to cover that. But I'm trying to decide which of these two, I don't want to make three out of five on that really important list that you should make some notation of, I've been telling you, to make sure you get extra thorough detailed notes. So um, I think uh, I'll make it this piece uh, because there's so much to say about the Vikings in there. By the way, I'm going to, this is a footnote, you don't have to write this. There is a map in the Vatican Museum in Rome. I want to go see it, but you have to be a high, high-ranking scholar to, to, to look at it, not, not a professor from a local college. I couldn't get permission. But I know people have seen it. It's a map of the New World created in 1410 or something. That's like 80-plus years before Columbus set sail. And it's from Scandinavia. It was created by a map maker in what's now, I think, Sweden. It might be Norway. Scandinavia, you know, is Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Finland. Although some people in Finland don't want to be called Scandinavian. My first girlfriend in high school was a Finnish exchange student. She said, we're not Scandinavian, but most of the world calls that. Whole four northernmost countries in Europe, right? Where the Vikings had their culture. Usually just called Scandinavia, and they're all, all independent countries. So in one of those, I think it was Sweden or Norway, there was a map maker who knew how to draw accurately the east coast of North America. Now, how did he know that? <laughs> and how did that piece get into the Vatican Library? What that tells you is, see, I don't believe in most conspiracy theories. I really don't. But there are some that make sense. And that's one, that the Catholic hierarchy. The Pope personally had to have known something about it when it was um, made and it was either purchased or suppressed, you could say suppressed, uh, kept quiet on the QT, what do you want to say, by the Catholic Church and they kept it in their library and wouldn't show it to anybody because somebody in the Catholic Church hierarchy knew that someone from Scandinavia hundreds of years earlier had to have gone to a new continent across the ocean where most people thought, of course, the world was flat. Uh, there were people in Europe who knew that wasn't true, of course, and the Arabs knew that. They were great navigators too, but they didn't cross the Atlantic. So it's just a little bit of evidence that there was some suppression of information, which we know happens today too. But anyway, back in the Middle Ages, or that was actually be, yeah, late mid Middle Ages, early 1400s, there is a map. It's been well documented. It was created 80 plus years before Columbus sailed, and it was uh, kept secret. Uh, in the Vatican Museum for centuries. It was sometime in the 20th century that it came to light. I've only seen reproductions of it. Okay, so we'll make this the one that's going to be um, the uh, <clears throat> one, but this is an important one. It could be on the exam. I'm not saying that it it, it is as high a probability as that last one, but it, uh, it, it's one I'm very unlikely to cut. We'll just say it that way, okay? Because it's an amazing place. All right. This is our last must know for tonight. Some of you have seen movies, video games, even commercials on TV, TV shows about spies in, in Russia. You've probably seen this building because it's iconic. St. Basil's Cathedral. St. Basil's, and that's, uh, you can abbreviate St. S.T. period. And Basil's is like, you know, the first name many uh, Russians used to have. There are not many name them, their kids that anymore. B-A-S-I-L. Basil's, possibly yes, of course, St. Basil's Cathedral, Moscow, I think everyone knows, right? It's M-O-S-C-O-W, 1555. Well, now, why are we looking at this? I mean, that's well past the end of not only the Dark Ages, but the whole Middle Ages. That's into the Renaissance. Well, here's why. Because in Russia, it was still the Dark Ages. I have friends from Russia, not to mention these. I've already told you a couple of times my daughter's from there. But I'm talking about long before I ever knew I'd adopt a child from Russia. I used to have friends there. I traveled in Russia on my own three or four times before ever adopting Elena, my daughter. And uh, when I did, I would meet Russians, edu well-educated Russians, who would say that about their own history, you know. Uh, teachers or historians or journalists uh, who, you know, like to talk to foreigners because back in the old Soviet Union days, you weren't supposed to talk to foreigners. You'd get in trouble for it. It's not true anymore. Anyway, so let's now talk about the meaning. We should be starting to take notes. What is this? Well, it was the Cathedral of Moscow for the Russian Orthodox Church, which should be somewhat a familiar concept to you because we covered the Byzantine Church 
right, which is Greek Orthodox. So it's an offshoot of the Greek Orthodox Church or Byzantine religion. In fact, that's another word that's often used to say that the Russian Orthodox Church is a branch of the Byzantine Orthodox religion. But really, it's its own. It has its own uh, pope, sort of. They don't call him a pope. They call him the Metropolitan, by the way. That word, remember some of you from the, um, uh, let's see, mosaic of Emperor Justinian. So we'll just say that this is a separate branch of Eastern or Greek Orthodox religion called the Russian Orthodox Church. This is their cathedral. It was, it isn't anymore. They built a whole big, fancy, much bigger, newer one. But this for centuries was the main cathedral in the city of Moscow, which of course was the capital of the Russian Empire. Now, that word, remember we discussed a couple times, I mentioned empire is something bigger than a kingdom, right? This was the period, the 1500s, in Russia when they were expanding they had kicked out the Tartars. Yes, that's Tartar sauce comes from that, that culture, T-A-T-A-R, the, the Asian culture that invaded Russia and conquered and occupied Russia for centuries. They had kicked them out by this time. And they were expanding and conquering uh, all kinds of neighboring kingdoms. You could just keep it simple. If you're curious to know what that would be like, what's now Persia and Turkey. If you look at a map, you see they have borders with those countries. And uh, Eastern Europe, what's now Poland, they had been invading these areas for centuries. So just keep it simple and say, this was the period during which the Russian uh, czar, right? And the armies, the Russian armies uh, were invading neighboring countries and, and expanding their empire. But it's also a period of, uh, again, ignorance, superstition and violence and uh, lawlessness in the countryside. Now, the czar, that's spelled, if you care to know the spelling, I won't hold you to it. It's not on syllabus. It's C-Z-A-R. So you know that means the ruler, the, the, the ultimate com complete ruler, right? Who had the same amount of power as those other kings we've been talking about tonight. Uh, at this time, it was Ivan the Terrible. This is an important part of the meaning of this. Ivan the Terrible had already expanded the Russian Empire and he was also an extremely violent man in his personal life. So here's the story that goes with this church. We know that he did kill his own son in front of a room full of people when his son wouldn't allow the czar, and that is again, Ivan the Terrible, just like it sounds. The son of Ivan the Terrible refused to allow his father to sleep with his wife. <laughs> The father wanted the son to share his wife. That's even in the ancient, I'm sorry, medieval times, that's, that's beyond what most kings would even think of. He got so angry when his son refused, standing in front of the, his father's throne, that Tsar Ivan the Terrible killed his son with one blow of his staff to the side of the temple of his son's head. Killed him. I mean, he actually, he didn't, he didn't kill him instantly. I misspoke. He bled to death within a, 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 a couple of minutes in his father's arms. His father immediately regretted what he'd done, but nobody did anything because he was the king. He was the ultimate ruler. You know, the czar means king in, in Russian. So nobody would punish him or think of it. So he had this cathedral built to atone for that act or sin of killing his own son over being, uh, you know, let's say infatuated. <laughs> with his son's wife and murdering his own son over that. Obviously, even for a czar, that, that didn't help his reputation, but nobody could do anything about it. So he continued to rule for the rest of his natural life, but he built this cathedral to make atonement, right? To atone for, or yeah, as an atonement, right? Uh, for his sin of killing his own son over being lecherous, right? So let's go up a little closer. And uh, this is from the Russian, uh, actually the Moscow City Tourist web, uh, website, Moscow City Tourist, Tourism, there we go, Tourism. Uh, I took it off their official website. It's pretty good, but it does make the colors look a little bit more kind of fantasy than they are. My own slide is, is really good at this, I have several, but uh, they're not digitalized. So we'll, this is what will be on exam if it is. So let's talk about the rest of the meaning is why are they these towers, these turrets, ending in these onion-shaped domes. Well, the theories we don't really know uh, exactly why 
but onions are a very popular and common and even some would say essential part of uh, Russian peasants diets because they can grow potatoes and onions and a few other vegetables and and can live off that and of course occasionally they would obviously have some meat if they were on a farm they could have all the above so just say that there's a theory that they are symbolic of one of the main staples of a russian diet especially for the millions of peasants who of course the czar ruled over but there's no way to know all we do know is that they are a russian invention these onion domes and here this one's gold just like it looks uh, are typical of Russian Orthodox churches, not just cathedrals, but any Russian Orthodox church. Even the smallest ones have like usually at least two onion domes, and I think I've never seen one with less than three. This has eight onion domes. You can only see what five here, one, two, three, four, five, actually six, right? Uh, no, it's nine. It's nine. Yeah, there's three if you walk around. Say one, two, three, four, five six, seven, and two more on the other side. So it's nine onion domes. I think that's more than any Orthodox church, at least a Russian Orthodox church, at least in Moscow. Anyway, there's another fact about it, which is that it uh, was designed by the leading architect. I don't even know his name. You don't need to know it. Uh, the, the, the most uh, famous, just say famous, architect in all of Russia, the Tsar ordered him to design this church and, and, and supervise the construction, you know, again, to atone for killing his son. He ordered this architect to build the most beautiful church in all of the Russian empire. And I don't think anybody would argue he succeeded. But here's the myth part, the last thing about the meeting. So somewhere along the line, the myth got, so you could just say there is a myth, that when Tsar Ivan the Terrible saw how beautiful the church was, he had that architect's eyes put out so he'd never design an equally beautiful building anywhere else in Russia. Well, the problem with that story is that that architect went on to design a lot of other churches all over the Russian Empire. I don't know about anybody else, but a blind architect, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> you can design anything. So it's a myth. And they tell tourists that. To this day, the tourists nod their head. I watched groups of foreign tourists standing. Oh, really? No, nah, it's just a myth. It's silly. I don't know how that got started any more than cutting down the cherry tree and, you know, George Washington and I don't know, all the silly myths that every culture has. So a common myth known to be false by well educated Russians, I'm sure there's some peasants who believe it, uh, is that uh, the czar uh, blinded the architect designed it as soon as he finished it so he wouldn't ever design thing equally beautiful. But the truth is that is not even close to true. He went on that architect to design several other churches and probably other buildings. Okay, that's plenty on the meeting. So we're going to now uh, wrap it up with a formal analysis and I'll stick around for questions. It's balanced. Well, sort of. You can say, oh, there's two large onion domes here and only one here. But if you walk around the other side, it, just say it has a rough balance because the tower is central, right? And it dominates. But if you want to say it's weighted, I wouldn't argue with you. Uh, yeah, because you have these smaller domes here. Yeah, so it is somewhat weighted. You could just say it that way. Uh, slightly or somewhat weighted uh, or unbalanced toward the left. Uh, and top to bottom, of course, it's obviously weighted toward the bottom. We have the rhythm of the onion domes, of course, and the decorative carving, the stone and brickwork. It's both st stone and brick. The outside is a mixture of stone and brickwork. And the textures are the real metal. Those are metal. These are metal, painted metal. And then, uh, so real smooth metal and glass in the windows. There aren't many windows, but there are a few. And then real rough stone and brick on the walls. The largest mass is the tower. It's about 120 feet high. So that's the space. It's one large open prayer room with smaller site. There are smaller rooms and this. This cathedral is big enough to have more than one big room. Most Russian Orthodox churches only have a single prayer room and that's it. Maybe one little room in the back for the priest to get dressed. But this one has several smaller rooms around one large prayer room with an open dome, well, tower. It's not really a dome. It, it curves upward, but it, we'll just call it a tower. It's an open tower, which uh, rises to about 120 feet above the floor. So that's the space. This is the real space. Okay, the, the um, modeling is the shadows from the sun, which changes during depending on the time of day the colors mixture of warm and cool but mostly warm warm on the walls except for some of the white trim and of course this dome onion dome is uh 
entirely cool white and blue. This one's a mixture of warm yellow and cool green. And the same here, mixture of warm uh, uh, red and cool green. And that, of course, is gold. So that's entirely warm. So it's a mixture, but it's more warm. The overall effect of the building is mostly warm. Uh, it's totally dynamic. The only thing stay, well, mostly dynamic, because the edges of the entrance, this is where the entrance is here, the, this porch, you have to go up these stairs and then you're in this it's a beautiful building inside. I have slides of it, but we'll not be able to see those. You can check it out online on um, the, the Russian tourism website. Yeah, the, you can see it's beautiful inside. So th this, I guess, it's so even this is curved though, isn't it? So it's really only the entryway that is totally stable. So it's, it is almost 95% dynamic because of the diagonal lines on the towers and the onion domes and the tapering spire. So it's almost entirely uh, dynamic. The largest mass is the central tower, of course. And then the taller domes, or ta taller towers and with, with the largest onion domes and then the shorter towers and then the entrance way, you can say, because the rest of it is the walls and it's broken up. It's not a single mass along the bottom of the walls. So then I guess fourth largest mass would be just the entry porch. It's actually a porch covered in case of snow. It snows a lot there in the winter. <laughs> okay, and then let's see. I already said the modeling is the shadows from the sun and the texture. Am I forgetting anything? Dynamic, space, balance. The rhythm, of course, we already mentioned. Up here in terms. Okay, uh, we're doing pretty well on the time. Uh, any questions about any of the slides we saw or anything we covered tonight? And then I'll stick around for those of you who have uh, questions about, you know, anything related to grading or if you join the, the uh, class late tonight. I will post this, of course, by Friday at 7 p.m. on uh, YouTube for anyone who didn't see it. Okay, do, are there any questions from anybody right now? Don't forget, if you didn't get your first paper in, um, you need to get really busy. And if you have your second paper and you want me to look at it, I will take a look at it and give you feedback. But don't wait till the d night before it's due, right? In other words, if you get it to me by uh, Sunday or even maybe Monday morning, I can give you feedback. Yeah, about before noon Monday. Um, but in other words, you all should know how to write it. And I will send you, a, a resend the cover sheet, which if you have the original document, you can just use it again. But if you just in case you want to or need to have a second copy, I will send an email reminding you of the deadlines, right? And the extension, I'm extending the deadline uh, to midnight Friday slash Saturday of next weekend. So you have a little longer than the next week, next class, I mean, to finish it and not have it be late. Okay, and then uh, for feedback, you need to get back to me by Monday morning or sooner. Um, okay, and, and if you didn't do the midterm, I don't know if that applies to anybody who's listening, uh, then those people need to, any, anybody in that, in that category needs to send me a visual evidence that they, the proof that they were uh, indisposed either by family or medical emergency during that week uh, when, it, when the exam was due. And then I can figure out an alternative assignment. Okay, anybody else have questions now? I'm going to stick around a few minutes after no, I... No yeah. questions. Okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. And we're ending this, like I said, before nine anyway, about 8.55. Okay. Last okay. call. Questions, you. you guys. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. All right. Good night. Yeah.